Okay, uh, welcome to another Stat 510 video. Um, today we're going to talk about, or today, I don't know when you're watching this. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about probability inequalities. Um, uh, this is uh, one of two videos that will round out uh, our sort of quick whirlwind tour of probability uh, before we finally move into uh, sort of the heart of the course where we talk about statistical inference. Um, so here we're going to talk about probability inequalities. And basically the idea is uh, sometimes a particular probability is difficult to calculate. So uh, instead, we can rely on some of these inequalities to help us simply bound uh, that uh, probability as best we can. Uh, and then often the hope will sort of be that in bounding that, um, uh, it's some expression where there's a, uh, a factor of the sample size n in the denominator and it'll vanish to zero as we increase the sample size, but that's too much preview for the next video. Uh, we'll sort of save it for then. Okay, uh, let's get started. Okay. Uh, so the first inequality that we're going to look at is called Markov's inequality. Um, and uh, we have to uh, consider some random variable x, which is non-negative meaning it can only take values um, zero or larger. Uh, and we're also going to assume that the mean exists. So this will work for a lot of distributions, but it won't work for things like Cauchy, um, which we talked about last time. Okay, so then uh, for any positive t, uh, the probability that x is greater than t is bounded above by the expected value of x divided by t. Okay, uh, quick proof of that. So uh, remember that we're dealing with uh, a non-negative random variable. So when we apply the defin definition of expectation, uh, that's what sets uh, these limits of integration here. Uh, and then the next step, all that I'm doing is I'm splitting apart the integral in two, first zero to t and then t to infinity. Uh, and it's important to note that this quantity here must be greater than or equal to zero because um, we're, uh, you know, x can only take values between zero and t in this integral. And, um, you know, f of x is a density function. So obviously that's uh, non-negative. Okay, so um, uh, the sum of these two uh, integrals is clearly uh, uh, bigger than or equal to uh, the second of those two integrals. If, if we just ignore the one that I pointed to and said is bigger than zero, that's sort of how that works. Uh, and then we can be sort of clever here. Since T is the, the smallest possible value that um, X can take here, um, we have this relationship. And then finally we have T times, well, that integral is basically, um, oh, Hold on, sorry, this shouldn't be a zero. That's clearly a T. Otherwise, what I was just about to say was not true and neither was previous thing. So uh, that integral that I just corrected, well, that's exactly the definition of the probability that X is greater than T. Cool. So then after a little bit of rearrangement, perhaps you can already see it, uh, we end up with exactly Markov's equality. Something like that. And a check mark that I realize you can't see. I'll go away. Bye. Uh, see you at the end of the video. There's the check mark to indicate that uh, I completed the proof. All right, great. Uh, next up, we have Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, and just a minor note here, uh, you might see Chebyshev's spelled uh, different ways, um, perhaps even starting with a T instead of a C. Uh, and that's because uh, the alphabet we're using here does not have a one to one relationship with the original Russian uh, that this name was written in. Okay, so um, very similar setup to Markov's, uh, but now we have this added condition uh, that um, we have a variance sigma squared. Uh, so then in that case, if we look at this probability um, that x, uh, we're looking at the, we're looking at, uh, the probability that um, the difference between x and mu, well, that is the distance between x and mu is greater than some value t. I realized I already wrote what I had intended to write along the way, is at most sigma squared over t. Uh, so what I'll write instead is a quick proof of that. 
So um, we'll simply start with the left-hand side. So that is x minus mu. Uh, the distance, the pro that is, uh, we're looking at distance is bigger than some value t. That probability. So what I can do is inside of here, I can square both sides. Um, and that's okay, because it maintains the inequality inside the probability. Um, and then I apply Markov's. So then that is the expected value that x minus mu squared, and then divided by t squared. Uh, and then this quantity here should be pretty familiar. That is just by definition, the variance. So we get sigma squared over t squared, and there we go. All right. So uh, quick example. So we're gonna assume we have some xi that are Bernoulli random variables with some success probability p. Uh, we'll define the sample mean that is x bar n the usual way. Uh, and the question we wanna ask is, well, how far away is the sample mean from this p, this probability of success? And perhaps you remember that when we have a Bernoulli random variable, the expected value of each xi is p, and the variance is p times one minus p. So uh, talking about that mean in particular. So what we're really asking here is um, how far away is the sample mean from the true mean? And we wanna make a probabilistic statement about this. So this probability statement that I have here is essentially saying, well, if epsilon is some error, what's the probability that you know x bar n uh, is, you know, the, greater than that far away from the true mean uh, in either direction. Okay, so uh, we apply Chebyshev's. And that tells us that at most, uh, that probability will be the variance of x bar n divided by epsilon squared. Uh, and because of the fact that we know the variance of each xi, and we know the variance of the sample mean, uh, we get p times one minus p all over epsilon squared. Uh, and furthermore, um, we can bound this quantity uh, a, little, uh, uh, a little more succinctly by saying this is at most one over four uh, times n times epsilon squared. And why can we do that? Well, perhaps you recall that p times one minus p is at most one fourth. Uh, and we can see that in this plot here. I'll put one half here on the p-axis and on the p times one minus p-axis, I'll put one fourth and then I'll draw this curve, maybe not too well, but you get the point. So at most that quantity can be one fourth. There we go. So what this says is, um, you know, the probability that uh, x bar n is, you know, some distance away from the true mean is at most um, one over four n epsilon squared, where again, epsilon is, you know, that distance, that error we're considering. But the real nice thing here is that uh, we have this n here in the denominator. And that's great, because that means that the larger the sample size is, the smaller this probability is. And, and in particular, if we let n go to infinity, this probability vanishes to zero which is great, which is saying that like, well, with enough data, the sample mean um, probabilistically is very close to the true mean. Um, that's a sneak preview of what we're gonna talk about in the next video, but that's something we like to see. We like to have, you know, as N goes up, these probabilities go down. Great. Okay, so how about another inequality? So here um, we have a very similar setup, uh, but we have some more constraints. So now we're gonna consider y1 through yn that are independent. And we're gonna say that um, uh, uh, they, they have mean zero. And in particular, each individual one is bounded by some quantity a and b, um, where those a and b's could be different depending on uh, which yi we're specifically talking about. So then if we, if we consider some epsilon greater than zero uh, for a particular t greater than zero, we have this sort of, uh, there's a lot of notation here, right? So I don't even want to necessarily read it all out. Uh, but, but it gives us a bound on the probability that the sum of the yi's is greater than some value. Okay. Um, 
But what I want to note here generally is that um, this is going to lead to some sharper inequalities. And that's because we have more conditions on the page here. So I think the next thing we're going to do. Um, oh, so um, right. So uh, before we sort of show an example of this, we're going to state uh, another inequality, which is basically just a particular uh, instance of the inequality I just showed. So now uh, we're going to assume that x1 through xn are Bernoulli p. Okay, so then we want to look at this probability, you know, that, that exact probability we we're looking at in the example, the probability uh, that the distance between uh, the sample mean and the true mean is that, uh, you know, is bounded below by epsilon. What is that probability bounded above by? And here we see an expression. Um, so I want to note that um, here, this x bar n minus p, well, the mean of that is zero. Uh, and each of these uh, x bar n minus p's, um, they will be bounded uh, by, by some constants a and b. So we can essentially apply this inequality. Uh, and this is the specific thing we get on the other side for a particular value of t. Um, I'm being a little bit vague here because uh, for this theorem, as it's stated in the book here, we're gonna use what I like to call proof by exercise where you uh, match those up uh, to convince yourself of that. But for now, uh, even though you haven't proved it yet, we're gonna go ahead and use this. Um, and we're gonna use this to see uh, the difference between using Chebyshev's to bound this, equal, uh, bound this probability, and uh, I, I'm reluctant to say this name because uh, I'm not exactly sure how to say it, but I think it's uh, Heftings. Uh, I don't know. That's probably wrong. Okay, so I've already written the two sort of general um, bounds here, but let's consider a particular n. So let's say we have an n of 200. Uh, and we want the the error that is like the distance between the sample mean uh, and um, uh, uh, the true mean to to be uh, at least uh, zero point one. Okay, so uh, then I just plug in some values. So we get one over four times. What did I say? Two hundred. Yeah. Two hundred times zero point one squared and I already plugged this into a calculator and we get something like 0 0.125. Okay. Um, right. Uh, and then um, for this one, we have 2e to the minus 2 times 200 times 0 0.1 squared. And that works out to be something like uh, 0 0.03663 and a bunch of digits. But what we can see is this inequality gave us a sharper bound than this inequality. And again, that's because um, we have a bunch more conditions here. And when you have more conditions, you can get a sharper result. Um, it's kind of how that works. All right. Um, and then just to round out the video real quick, we won't go uh, into these in too much detail. Um, while we're talking about... Um, inequalities, we may as well throw in a couple inequalities for expectations. Uh, the first of which uh, is called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Um, and the second of which is which is called Jensen's. Um, so Jensen tells us, for example, um, there's just sort of two forms about it, of it, whether depending on if you have a function g that's either convex or concave. But if it's convex, we get that the expected value of g of x is greater than or equal to g of expected value of x. Um, we'll probably see this come up later. Uh, for example, if we wanted to um, show that uh, uh, the sample standard deviation is biased, uh, this, this would come in handy. But we haven't talked about these things yet, so um, I, I don't want to show that. Okay, um, sort of a shorter video, um, but really um, the main takeaway here was um, uh, Chebyshev's and Markov's, which uh, give us some. Uh, bounds on some probabilities, um, but with not strong distributional assumptions. Uh, and those will come in handy in the next video uh, where we talk about convergence. Um,
So normally I say, if you made it to the end of the video, good job, but hopefully this was short enough that everyone made it, uh, but still good job. Uh, and I'll see you in the next one.